Hi, I'm Vasco Duarte. I'm the host of the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, but today I'm on the Agile Uprising podcast. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Agile Uprising podcast. I'm Brad Stokes and today my co-host is uh, James Gifford. James, say good day. Hey, it's been a while. It's been a while. And we're joined today by Vashka. Vashka, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, how would our readers know you? I've been around the community for a while. You run your own podcast, but there's a lot to you. So how about you give us a bit of an intro to yourself? Yeah, so definitely my uh, main daily job is to do Scrum Mastering and Agile Coaching, uh, as well as on the side, running a small company that produces content on the Agile niche. So that would be, uh, we produce the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, as well as uh, publish books with authors in the Agile field. That's Oikosofi, that's the name of the company. And uh, many of you, if you're listening to a podcast, you probably heard of the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast. And that's where I spend a lot of my non-Agile coaching and Scrum Mastering uh, time producing that show uh, that publishes every day a new episode about a specific topic related to being a Scrum Master. Uh, it's an incredible um, effort. I, I know how long it takes to master one of these shows. So I, I can only imagine that, you know, the 15 minutes that you do every day, that has to be a bit of a grind. Yeah. So my background is in lean. So many, many years ago, before I discovered Agile, I was studying lean. And one of the things we learned when we study lean is that you standardize and improve. And that's what I did with the podcast. So uh, I can do 15 minutes of podcasting uh, published per day uh, because I have a, a great team behind that is helping. Uh, and of course, because I've set up the system so that it works that way. But uh, uh, it, it wasn't like that when I got started, but I just I, I just improved all the time. And uh, now I can do a, a whole week of shows in about two hours, uh, which is not bad. Uh, it's still, of course, an investment and there's all the tools and so on that you need to invest in. But um, happily, this is a format that people enjoy. So it's 15 minutes on a specific topic for Scrum Masters. And I get a lot of feedback about people who started their Scrum Master career by listening to the podcast and, and enjoy it and, and take value out of it. And that's really why we do it to help scrum masters out there to be awesome scrum masters. So I know when I was coming into the field of um, moving from say a senior IT lead into the scrum master space, I, I actually found the resource invaluable. So it's been great for the community. And the topic today we're actually going to hit and we're going to hit pretty hard is that scrum masters are going to change the world of work. This is a massive statement. I, I absolutely love it. But you're just going to have to lead us in a little bit more. Scrum Master is changing the world of work. Tell me all about it and tell me why. Well, so it all starts with the fact that the role exists. That already is a massive change, a massive transformation in the world of work, where if you think about you know, where, where we came from, it was very much hierarchical setting with top-down order, uh, uh, order setting, and then the people at the team level, at the groundwork, on the day-to-day -day job, taking orders from their managers. And the Scrum Master role is a totally different perspective on the role of a leader, because Scrum Masters are leaders, but they have no formal authority. They are not part of the hierarchy. They work with their peers. We as Scrum Masters, we consider our team our peers. We consider the product owner our peer. We don't we don't hold any status uh, superiority. We don't hold any formal authority. We do have special knowledge and special skills. That's what makes us great scrum masters, right? We know how to make teams work well together. We know how to foster collaboration. We know how to start and guide difficult conversations. All of those things are extremely important in the new world of work where the majority of the work we do is what you would call knowledge work. In other words, where the person doing the work understands more about the work than the person managing that person doing the work. And that transforms the role of a leader. And my own perspective is that Scrum Masters are already there. They are already that leader and they can, and I wrote a, 
uh, post about it, which I guess we'll link to in the show notes, they can become tomorrow CEOs because they have all the skills. In that post, I talk about Alan Mulally, who was the CEO of Boeing and Ford, and he describes how he works and how he worked with his leadership team. And I was listening to that podcast where Alan describes his own way of working, and I'm thinking, This is exactly what we do as Scrum Masters. We don't tell people what to do, but we ask the right questions. We don't necessarily force people to admit mistakes, but we create the necessary space and psychological safety for people to come forward and say, hey, you know, this thing happened. What can we do about it? Right. So that's what we do as Scrum Masters. And here was a CEO explaining their work in the same approach that I take as the approach that is correct and and right for a scrum master. So I think that we are just by being scrum masters already taking a huge step in transforming the world of work. So to transform the world of work, we obviously need to be an influence. You can't do scrum mastering without influencing others. It's um, I, I always love the John Maxwell quote on this. If you're a leadership with leader without um, followers, you're just a fool wandering in a dry place. Um, I may have misquoted it, but it's pretty damn close. Uh, now, for a Scrum Master to develop that uh, servant leadership within the team to transform the change of work, the world of work, there needs to be a buy-in from the company that they're working for because it seems like Scrum Masters can sometimes be given short shrift. Um, they're maybe not valued as much as they should be. Uh, how do we shift that need? Yeah, so that's a very good point. Uh, it, it might be worth investigating a little bit why scrum masters are not given the authority that they not the authority, but the the respect and and the um, uh, you know the spotlight. For example, agile coaches are given the spotlight all the time, and we know of environments where there's an agile transformation, where the agile coaches are the ones working with leadership. They are the ones working on the quote unquote agile change program. And then the scrum masters are just, you know, the people working with the team. So lackeys. Yeah. Right. And I think that that's exactly the role that needs highlighting the role of working with the teams every day, because you don't go through a company transformation by setting up a change program. You go through a company transformation by the people in the organization changing how they work. That's what the transformation is. Yes. The transformation is not the transformation program. The transformation is not the big speeches. The transformation is not talking about what leadership needs to do. The transformation is doing the work differently every day. And for me, that's what bears and what needs highlighting is how that is happening. Mm. And that is happening at the team level with the people in the team and with the help of the scrum master. So my own observation is that many scrum masters tend to be a little bit shy and perhaps even uh, ashamed of being scrum masters. And, and you know, one day they all want to be agile coaches. And, and what I'm trying to say, and, and we build a whole event, the scrum master summit around this idea, is that we need to build a strong Scrum Master community that highlights the role and creates an identity that helps all Scrum Masters out there be proud of what they do, work with the team every day, but also learn, right? And share and share stories like we do on the podcast, share insights, share models, share tools, Mm -hmm. and create connections, network that helps us to tackle those challenges of doing the real transformation every day down there with the team uh, in an agile transformation. So I hope that, uh, you know, through this event and through the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast and also through the work you guys do with your podcast, that we bring uh, light to this very important transformation and agile adoption work, which is the working with the team every day. Mm. Now, there's been a couple of bits of things that I'd love to look at is with the Scrum Master name itself, the the word, um, we can't even seem to agree on that word. There, there's um, people that talk about the, the Spotify model that isn't a model that uh, calls the person that would sit in a role of a Scrum Master as agile coaches. So we've got a blend there. You've got people that want to call them iteration ma- managers. Um, you've got people that want to call them a delivery lead within an agile framework. Um, so it gets a little bit muddy. The, the water's already muddy. And um, one of the observations I've got out there is half the time Scrum Masters feel like people 
still don't know what they do. I mean, this role's been around for Scrum now almost 20 years. Um, so how do we actually get to a point where a Scrum master can be proud of their job when the majority of the people that look at what they do don't, can't even define that role? It's a very good point. Uh, well, so first it starts by setting a vision. We need to have a vision of what this role, the Scrum Master role is about. And uh, I, I have my own vision of what the role is, but of course it is up to the community to define that. So we need to get together. We need to talk like, you know, in the Scrum Master Summit, through podcast appearances, writing blog posts, having arguments on Twitter, whatever there is, but be active in the community in setting what the vision is. So if we as a community of Scrum Masters, don't have a clear vision of what the role should be, we can't really ask anyone else to have it. So I, I've set mine in that article we were just talking about a moment ago. I think that the Scrum Master role is where future CEOs go to learn to be CEOs. And the reason for that is very simple. I think that the world of work is changing because the majority of the work that we do today is around services, product development. It's all knowledge work. Now, this is not the whole work, but it's a vast amount of the po positions, the jobs, the industries out there is knowledge work. So how do we work there? We can't use the same structures we used in manufacturing, although you know, some would argue that Toyota has shown a different way also in manufacturing. But, you know, taking that aside, the majority of manufacturing organizations are still using a very much top down authoritarian type of management structure in knowledge work that doesn't work. And, and we know it doesn't work because very often in product development, in software development, the manager knows less about the content of the work than the worker uh, um, no. So we need to focus on that reality and create roles that support, that thrive in that reality. And the Scrum Master role is one of those. So set that vision. And that's what I'm calling on the community to do. That's why I'm organizing this event as well. Set that vision, evolve that vision, and then act it out. Because that's one of the things that we need to recognize is that Scrum Masters are not going to have an impact in the place where they work if they're going to wait for other people to give them authority, because they might not be interested in giving them authority. And some people will call it, you know, empower scrum masters. Well, scrum masters need to empower themselves. They need to help the teams despite the lack of authority. And that's by definition, because the scrum master is, according to the scrum framework, not a manager. It does not hold any, uh, you know, status or, or, or hierarchical authority. So, Acting, setting the vision and then acting out that vision, I think, is how we Scrum Masters clarify the role. And you mentioned a few uh, uh, examples of other roles that, you know, people just rename Scrum Master as like development uh, delivery lead was one of the, the, the terms you used. I've used that. The iteration manager is another one. The people who use those roles to describe the Scrum Master are people who do not understand Agile fundamentally. Right. If we look at the values of the Agile Manifesto, there's one that should stand out for everyone. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. While the Scrum Master is the guardian of the Scrum Framework within the Scrum Framework, they are not the ones telling people what to do. They are, however, the ones bringing people together through facilitation, through setting up the meetings, through starting conversations, through one-on-ones that lead into a shared discussion between stakeholders and team, or even between team members, through conflict resolution. All of those are fundamentally different from being a delivery lead or an iteration manager. In fact, the way I put it is that our domain of operation as Scrum Masters is collaboration. It is not software delivery. That's the team. It is not the definition of what should be delivered. That's the product owner. It is not about the process itself because that's already defined for us. It's Scrum. It's simple. Just follow it. Don't mess with it. It is about creating collaboration within that context. And none of those other roles inspire the word collaboration. Like delivery lead, that's not a collaborative role. Iteration manager, that's not a collaborative role. But that's what the Scrum Master is. It is about collaboration. A little bit funny that even I think one of the guys that came up with that, I can't remember if it was Jeff Sutherland or um, Ken Schwaber that said that they made a bit of a mistake calling the Scrum Master a Scrum Master because it's got that sort of connotation of uh, perfection. 
Um, so people might even be a little bit bashful. I'm the Scrum Master. You're the master of what? Um, it, it's just one of those funny little things. It, it, how do we actually get impact? Like, like you said, that um, it's important for Scrum Masters to almost empower themselves. Um, how do you see people stepping up to that plate, uh, so to speak, being ready to empower themselves? It, it, uh, having a vision for what you do is very important, but is, is it just having a vision within your context? Is it having a wider vision of the value that you bring your company? Um, if I'm a scrum master of say three or four or five teams, um, which yes, that's slightly insane because you know you don't have time to actually dedicate to anyone. But you know, how do I actually take back some of that internal control rather than having things foisted on me where I'm actually delivering and helping my team to deliver? And, and of course, we've said software develop, develop, development, but I don't see that it just has to be software development. It can be delivery of something in general. Yeah. So. Yeah, so the, starting from the first one, like how do I empower myself as a scrum master? Well, first, I need to be confident in my role as a scrum master, right? Like, do I believe that the role has an impact? And if I don't, maybe I should have another role and that's okay too. Then the second thing is, do I recognize what success for me is? And, you know, we interview every week, we interview a different scrum master and on Thursday, we talk about what's success for scrum masters and if you listen to the podcast there's some answers that repeat over and over again but there are quite a few set of answers out there and at the end of the day the goal of that is we need to define ourselves what success means like you know listen to others but define for yourself and then once you define for yourself then the next thing is how do i act within that definition of success for my role as a scrum master like you know who do i talk to um what kind of collaboration techniques do i use to help my team uh what kind of meetings do i need to set beyond the scrum framework in order for, to get the right people to talk to each other how do i help team members resolve conflicts how do i help the team resolve conflicts with stakeholders like all of those things it's about us defining what we do and when we think of scrum master as a role around the collaboration domain it's very easy to take ownership because in most organizations today, nobody owns that. Managers, yeah, I mean, in, in many organizations, managers don't focus on collaboration. Team members don't focus on collaboration. Uh, product managers don't focus on collaboration. So who does? And of course, the answer is obvious. It's the scrum master, right? So that's one example of where, where an area is that is very easy to take ownership and to actually act out that empowerment because there's very few people paying attention to that so critical aspect of knowledge work that is collaboration. You're, you're right. I mean, the collaboration is a, it's, it's something that a lot of people don't do really well at, at all. <laughs> well, at least in most of the companies I've worked at, but you know, with us, you know, with the Scrum Master being a, a true facilitator and kind of having that facilitative stance in their in their toolbox, you know, we've be, having a Scrum Master that can facilitate a meeting so that the people, the team, the product owner can just really focus on that problem and not worry about notes, keeping the meeting going, the time calculation, you know, keeping the, the time clock kind of um you know, good for, for a meeting or, or things like that. There's something to be said about having the skills to kind of keep a meeting moving and keep people engaged in the work. And, you know, I guess from a, from a scrum master standpoint, facilitation isn't taught um, like it used to be. Um, I guess from that, that, that facilitation and, and scrum mastery and collaboration all kind of go together hand in hand. And it's, it's one of those things that I kind of see is, is a differentiator of the, of the people we talk to. Like when I look at the different, I mean, I've, I, I run a team of a large team of scrum masters and agile coaches. And when I, when I interview people that are in this role, you know, one of the things we focus on is, is facilitation because those, that's the, in my mind is the, the bedrock for, for collaboration but I, I just don't see those skills. So I guess from your perspective, you know, how are, how much of a big part of 
building out facilitation skills kind of ties into that the scrum master role james that's a great point uh so first of all i think that scrum masters should be really on top of the game when it comes to facilitation uh and i mean you've said it and i would like to highlight that facilitation is the bedrock of collaboration this is where collaboration is based uh, if there's no good facilitation collaboration will only emerge by accident not by design Scrum masters are therefore, uh, and should therefore, uh, focus on developing their own facilitation skills. There's a bunch of things we could do for that, but uh, in the podcast, in the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, what I try, what I try to do is to extract those facilitation approaches from Scrum masters out there doing the job every day, in the context of the stories that they are telling us. Because one of the things is that to learn a facilitation skill, whatever that might be. There's great work being done by the liberators, which is kind of a, a, a group of people focusing on, on liberating structures as, as a big toolbox of facilitation tools. Uh, and they have a great app indeed. There's, there's also the, um, the retromat.org that has a bunch of facilitation techniques for retrospectives and so on. All of those are great tools, but it is the context. It's the stories in which we use those tools that matter for us. And that's why I'm so, so big on telling stories in the podcast, because, you know, in real life, we don't have the perfect setting for using a tool. We have to improvise very often, even if we have a plan. Right. And, you know, there you go. Being agile as a scrum master, have a plan for the meeting and then improvise because you will need it very often. Right. And and we need to be confident in our facilitation skills and we need to practice those skills all the time. And one very important facilitation skill that we very little we talk very little about is of keeping the right conversations going. And I, I, I know that this is a little bit fuzzy and abstract, but if you listen to most of the episodes where we, you know, share stories about what happened and what the Scrum Master learned and what they applied and so on, you will hear this underlying red line that connects all of those stories, which is that it's conversations that don't happen that lead to problems. It's conversations that turn into conflicts that lead to problems. And as scrum masters, we really should be paying attention to those conversations. Sometimes those conversations happen in places where we can't see them, especially now with COVID and everybody working from home, like, you know, DMs on, on, on your chat system, emails that you never see. But we bring people together on a regular basis and we can see if there's tension. We can see if there's collaboration. Like, And just listening to people not talking to each other, which is an, a, another great example, is an immense skill that Scrum Masters can develop. And, and that re requires being fully present and paying attention where we are. That requires learning about uh, critical conversations that require learning about nonviolent conversation, nonviolent communication, pardon me, that requires learning about liberating structures as well and all of those retrospective techniques that are out on, on retromet.org and, and uh, um, uh, other retrospective tool uh, collections. But that, that aspect of listening to the conversation that is happening and the one that should but isn't, like that learning that, is not something you learn in school. It's something you practice every single day. Now we can practice this in coaching sessions. I'm organizing now the Scrum Master Summit uh, in, in May where we will have every day a coaching clinic where you go and you practice your coaching skills because that's a very important part of keeping that conversation going, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or you know as an intermediary or in the daily standup or in the planning meeting, whatever that is, right? So I think that, James, is something that even though it sounds like it's something very well defined, it's something that you really need to learn. That's why I'm saying, you know, CEOs as being the key conversation keepers for an organization, they should go through the Scrum Master role and learn that, learn that viscerally and intuitively by being there and being part of those conversations every day. And, and we as Scrum Masters need to learn that too. And I mean, I know that there's a lot of places we can go to learn, but at the end of the day, it's by doing that we learn best. So we need to be confident of our identity as Scrum Masters, have the support of the community when problems arise, they will. 
have a clear vision of what we should be doing and then practice every single day. Have a reflection on Friday. We very often talk about that on the podcast. You know, as a scrum master, I need to collect feedback, collect feedback from your peers, but also do your own reflection on Friday, 15 minutes, whatever, you know, write down the things you've learned, the things you'd like to know, and then ask the community, network with your peers and learn. From yeah. Them. I mean, I a hundred percent agree with you. I, the, the idea that, I mean, CEOs and, and leaders should start out in the Scrum Master role. It's something that, you know, we're, you're always looking at how do we fill this role? Um, at least in the States, there's a lot of rebadging of, of project managers. There's people that they send to the two day class and they go breathe in it. And then they're a Scrum Master. Um, you know, we, we, we've been looking at different roles and when, you, when you're kind of resource constrained and you're not able to bring up uh, or hire potentially people that have experienced folks, you know, what do you, what do you do? Uh, well, hopefully you bring in somebody that has experience that can help shepherd some of these folks and you have some motivated people to kind of learn from that. But one of the things that I've always kind of recommended when I've you know done consulting or full-time roles is, you know, we, we find ourselves in a hybrid role position where we have a scrum master that's on a team that's acting as the scrum master for that team and maybe doing, you know, 40% development work, 60% the scrum master role. You know, I've always tried to encourage organizations that this is your, this is your primer for leadership. You're, these are, these scrum masters, if you look at this role in the way that it's supposed to be, and you're not going to go hire outside full time or, or things like that. Like this is your management farm, and the I so I'm I'm in full support of the that that idea. It's selling that idea to organizations to say, you know, we they're because you got to think about how they a lot of the at least in the states how people became managers uh, of development teams of QA organizations things like that. It's it's because they were the best firefighter. They were the they were the person that always got it done. They were the hero. And so now we've got a bunch of heroes in the leadership teams and trying to sell them on this idea that, you know, I, I, we want to bring up these scrum masters into those positions. I, I'm, I, you know, I look at that as kind of one of those, those paradigm shifts of to, to kind of move organizations towards that. Yeah, absolutely. Let, let me give you a concrete example. Uh, you were talking about, you know, leadership teams these days are collections of heroes because that's what got them into that position. Uh, absolutely agree. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why they can't collaborate with each other because they're all heroes trying to fight for the spotlight. Now, how, how are you going to create collaboration in a group like that? Right. So leadership teams are the teams that most need the scrum master role that most need somebody in the team that is able to facilitate conversations to make sure that people have a shared goal and work together towards it. And that's why I think that that article that I wrote based on Alan Mulally's podcast is so important. Really go and listen to that episode to hear what Alan, who's you know an accomplished CEO by all means, sharing how he runs those meetings where you know you have a bunch of heroes because that's what those leadership teams are usually. And how he is able to get them to collaborate, to get them to be vulnerable towards each other, to get them to share what's going wrong so that they can together be heroes again, instead of trying to be heroes alone, right? He shares this this story about a guy that for the first time shows a red, a red uh, light in the weekly report. And uh, he sits back and starts applauding that guy because until then, Ford was losing 17 billion, but everything was green. Right. Nobody was a able or willing to admit that something was wrong. And the first guy did it and he applauded it. That's what a scrum master would do. Right. Create the psychological safety by highlighting transparency and, uh, uh, you know, celebrating the opportunity opportunity to now do something about solving the problem. Right. So uh, I, I think that one of the hopefully future visions for the scrum master role is that it's in all teams in the company starting with the leadership team it might not be the ceo doing that role it might be somebody else it doesn't matter but leadership teams need scrum masters the most because they have the worst run meetings they they are the worst at keeping time boxes for those discussions they just want to talk over each other they just want to shine a light on themselves but the company needs them to work together. They need that team of heroes to become a hero team. 
And that only a Scrum Master can do. How do we shift the conversation from um, the heroes, as you said, talking to the Scrum Masters? Because the Scrum Masters are often the squeaky wheel. This is almost a... Um, they're the people that are going to say, look, these are the problems that my teams are facing. And they're uncomfortable conversations for the heroes to actually hear. They're the people that are going to step in and say, no, you can't just go to X team member because it throws out the cadence of this entire team. You're having a material impact by actually going to, the, you know, they're the people putting the spotlight on the things that aren't quite working. That doesn't always make them the most popular people amongst the heroes above them. How do we shift that? Yeah. You yeah, Scrum Masters need to learn that they can't be the ones coming up with the problems, but they need to be the ones creating the space and the necessary conditions for the people doing the work to come up with the problems, right? It's completely different if somebody in the team says, hey, we need to solve this, or if the Scrum Master, who's an outsider, literally by definition, saying, hey, you guys have this problem, right? So. Uh, I mean, we might ask the right questions, which is not necessarily easy, but it's very powerful, right? Uh, I, I was just talking to a, to a team and they had a problem. It took them three days to create the build for a software. Uh, and, and then I said, so what, what happened? And they were, you know, sharing some of the technical challenges. And then it happened again. And then I asked, hmm, this seems to be happening quite often. I wonder what could be the reason. And especially what could be the reason it wasn't solved in the first place. And then the team started talking about it. Now, at that time, they just accepted reality and moved on. And then later on, I asked the same question again. Hmm, wasn't this what happened two sprints ago? Why is it still happening? Right? The, this, these questions uh, create dialogue. It doesn't always lead to solutions directly, but it leads to recognition that maybe later on will turn into a conversation about setting up a solution, right? And learning to use questions, learning to um, foster a productive co uh, conversation is, is one of the most important skills for us as Scrum Masters. We don't want to be the squeaky wheel. We want to be the person who helps the wheel say, hey, I'm squeaky. So... What one of the retros I absolutely love is a wish to action retro where you go through, you, you know, I wish, I want, I wonder what would happen, you know, the, the out there and then coming down and, okay, what can we control? What don't we control? Okay. What actions can we get? I find that's really powerful, but there are always things that fall kind of into that. We don't really have as much control as we'd like to have. And often the team will look to the scrum master who, you know, being the servant that they are, will try to highlight that and, have that conversation outside the team and, and therefore end up looking like the squeaky wheel. So how do we move beyond that paradigm? Because that actually does, that, that is one of the hardest things as a scrum master is figuring out where that line is. I, I find personally, it's one of those ones that is always really hard is figuring out where those lines are of um, moving the conversation beyond the team. Because the conversation in the team, the team can fix certain things. And if they've been given the autonomy and the leverage to do that, that's fantastic. They can fix things at team's level. But there's sometimes organizational problems. There's sometimes interference from a higher level. And, and you know, it's not the scrum master sitting there with their big bouncer shoes, you know, the bouncer vest on and protecting the team insanely. Um, but that, that can be one of the things that the scrum master may need to have those conversations out. But Again, they can seem like the fly in the ointment, even if they're not. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that the identity of the role is important for is exactly to help us define when it's time to act and when it's time to stand back. If I look at the Scrum Master as the person who solves all problems outside the team, then that's one perspective. If I look at the Scrum Master as the person who creates the collaboration necessary to solve all problems, whether it's inside or outside, then it's a totally different role. It's still the Scrum Master. So what do I think my role as a Scrum Master is? At the end of the day, we need to have a very clear identity for ourselves. It's not for others, for ourselves to do our job. We need to have a very clear identity of what their role should be about. And as I said, my own perspective on the Scrum Master role is that our domain of expertise is collaboration. 
It's not organizational change. It's not manipulation, which some people will think that it is, but it isn't. It's not necessarily software development, even though that might be our background. It's not project management, even though that might be our background. It's about getting the right people to spend some time together so that they can own and solve the problem, right? Ownership, creating ownership is a huge superpower that we can have as Scrum Masters through the collaboration focus, right? Because it's not about us owning, it's about the organization owning. Sometimes we are part of that ownership, sometimes we're not, but that that's one of the key questions for us. What's our identity, right? So uh, one of the definitions of success that comes up over and over again in the, the podcast as I interview guests is, they you know, I'm successful as a Scrum Master when my team doesn't need me. And, uh, and that's a very valid one, but what it hides is that the team only doesn't need you when they own everything, 100% of their reality. Now, if we can get there, that's excellent. There's always going to be areas where they don't, but that's an area where we can improve, right? So like thinking about our identity and then acting it out, even without authority, but just through the collaboration focus as an example, I think that's how we help teams to own their performance, to be proud of what they do, and also to go out of that control circle and establish the necessary relationships to either extend the circle or collaborate with others who own those other parts and get the problem solved. Because that's one of the hidden dynamics that I see in Agile teams. We don't very often talk about this in the Agile community, but one dynamic that I see in successful Agile teams is that they are constantly increasing the cycle of control constantly increasing up to the point where they own everything except very little few things like you know what's the roadmap for the product but even the backlog they already own because now the product are, is in the team and points. it's part, um, it's you know, part it's of the process of design some of this the, in the leadership the squeaky wheel the ownership thing there these are all kind of spaces that you that it, it's hard for organizations to kind of carve out you can I mean, we've done some of this space carving out by taking the the, the leadership team and, and making them a scrum team, whether they knew it or not, uh, and, and helping the, the scrum masters have that space through a, a basically a, a leadership roll up, if you will, um, at the end of every sprint. So taking the results from the sprints, getting them together, kind of reviewing, hey, here are the here are some of the impediments that are outside the the control of the the team. Here are things that we need the leadership to step in and, and you go solve. Kind of making that, bring those heroes together to kind of go solve some of those challenges and make them work together as a, as a team. Um, but you're, you're right. And so ownership, team ownership, what they can, what, what kind of decisions, things like that. Those are, those are things that are, those, those are kind of difficult areas for organizations to let go of. Um, so, I mean, I'd, I'd be interested to hear some some points on on how you kind of work with um, help the teams create that space, um, because that is a that's a huge area that kind of I, th I would say really holds back teams. Um, we've used some different things with, you know, the delegation. You're, we, we modified Jurgen Nopello's delegation poker to be a delegation board and we plotted it out and say, you know, team, you want to own X, Y, Z, you know, you want to, we want to fully delegate this to you. Here's where the areas that we forced the conversation of here's where you guys need to grow as a team to own this decision. So we let them, we let the team say, where do you guys want to go? Where, what decisions do you want to own? And then forcing kind of that conversation of, all right, manager, for you to let this go, how do you get the, the people from, <laughs> you're telling them what to do to, to fully delegate and what does that look like? Um, so how, I mean, what are, how do you kind of, as a scrum master, how do you kind of help create some of those spaces for some of this ownership? Absolutely. Lost? So there's a few things that are required before ownership can emerge, right? You can never emerge, uh, sorry, you can never own somebody else's task list that was given to you, right? I call those shopping list management teams, right? The, you get a shopping list and all you have to do is go to the supermarket and get everything that is on the shopping list, no matter how long it takes, right? 
Now, if you're in that kind of situation, there's very little ownership that you can exhibit or even uh, take because everything's been said, right? There's, your opinion doesn't matter. Only your time matters. So use your time to do these things. If you're in that situation, well, to tough luck. It's not going to happen. Uh, the ownership is not going to emerge. So one of the things that I talk to the teams that I work with is that for ownership to even start to emerge, first, we need to have a goal, not how we get there, but just a goal and need to be very clear about what that goal means for everybody, right? So have a conversation about the goal and what it means and you know what are the many things we could be doing and that's the beginning of your backlog now i would prefer instead of a long backlog i would prefer to have an impact map and a story map but that's my approach so that we are not on purpose we are not giving a shopping list to the team we are telling them this is roughly what it looks like to be successful and then the team can express their creativity on how to get there because one of the things that this shopping list approach hides is that we are actually removing the possibility of being creative at work. When we give teams an already predefined and very well-groomed user story backlog, right? That's something we don't talk about, but you know, my own approach is that your backlog should be one, two sprints at most. Everything else should be higher level, impact map and story map. That's just one example. So I would say start there, set the goal. Now, the cool thing that happens when you start talking about goal is that suddenly everybody's got an opinion on what the goal should be. The developers, the testers, the UX people, uh, you know, everybody in the team has an opinion of what the goal should be. And that's great because now you can co-create the goal that will, in fact, create the ownership. And that co-creation process, i.e. the team is contributing to the clarification of the goal, creates the beginning of that ownership process. Now, I, I'm not an expert in this. You, you might want to look at the responsibility process by Christopher Avery, and you see how you can create an environment and a set of steps that lead from, this is not my problem, to I own this, and now I, I'm the owner of my future, right? So look at the responsibility process as an example, as an inspiration to design a workshop around, you know, impact map, goal definition, and so on. That's one example. But this is what a collaboration specialist would do. If we look at ourselves as Scrum Masters, as the guy who makes sure that the stories are moving on the board, we can't do this. But if we look at our role as the guy who looks at what's available and puts everything together so that the team takes ownership, like, for example, who sets the goal? Like, do you know who sets the goal in your team and in your environment, in your organization? Maybe you don't. Well, find that out and then have a conversation with them. Hey, we think the goal is this. Do you agree? I talked with the team and the product owner, and from what you, talk, you, what you tell us, dear stakeholder, we think the goal is this. Is this what you have in mind? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. If not, then, of course, reiterate. But if it is, then do the next thing. Okay, so we believe that in order to achieve this goal, we have these different options. That's an impact map, by the way, right? We have these different options to reach that goal. Do you agree? Yes, I agree. Which one do you think we should try first? And why do you think so? And now you're creating that conversation that will create the necessary conditions for collaboration to emerge. That's what collaboration experts do, right? They get people together. They make sure they understand each other. They help them create, co-create a language that helps them communicate quickly, like, you know, over email or, or chat or whatever, because you, you need that these days. And then go on and execute. Collaboration specialists don't make sure we have a enormous backlog with all the details in it. Collaboration specialists make sure that the right people know who to talk to when something isn't clear. Well, what's the saying? The user story isn't a um, specification written stone. It's a, converse, it's a promise of conversation. And that's how it was created. But somehow we forgot about that. And I still today talking with clients, they all tell me, oh, I wish my product owners would be better at writing user stories. And then I look them, I look at them and say, okay, so what would be a good user story for you? And then turns out that a good user story turns out to be a very detailed specification. It's like, okay, you don't need that because the team can create that. What you need is a very clear definition of what success looks like. 
right? The the old three C's, uh, three C's idea, the card, the, i.e. the user story that reminds us that we need to have a conversation. That's the second C. And the acceptance criteria that confirms, confirmation is the third C, that we've actually delivered what we promised. I, I blame it on a on a misunderstanding of the definition of ready. <laughs> when you have the scum guy talks about a definition of ready, that that readiness means like these eighteen things on a checklist. I want to I want to start blaming it there. <laughs> oh well, you go. It's all Garande. He says what uh, six to eight things. Anything more than that, and you've uh, destroyed any possibility of actually being dynamic and creative. Checklists are great. I would say three to five. He would actually do two. He said that six to eight is his absolute maximum. Uh, but I, I like three to five. And definitions have done very similar sorts of things. I, I like them to be nice and concise because it gives me wiggle room. And uh, wiggle room is where we can have the conversations. And adaptability. Again, not written stone, promises of conversations, all, all these artifacts, but, but they're tools. Like, like we, we talk about them like they're the sacred cows, they're the things that can't be changed, but these are tools. And a backlog is just another tool in your ability to deliver something. It, it's not the end goal. It's just one of the things. And your tool can be rusty and cruddy and sitting in a really dirty box with 500 other tools that are all similarly mismanaged. Or you can have something sleek and minimalist and, and just does what it's supposed to do, which might be exactly like you say, I really like short backlogs. I like, you know, two to three sprints, pretty well defined. We're not perfect, but we're going to be able to pick them up and use them. But anything beyond that scope, I, I just see it as waste. Um, it's nice to know what's coming, but not to the nth degree because it doesn't, it changes by the time it hits you. So I, completely 100% reflect what you've said with that. Um, Scrum Master's changing the world of work. So we, we, we've talked about the collaboration specialists, which I, I love that definition. That's a beautiful definition of what a Scrum Master does and is. Scrum Masters, again, they're, they're set at the team and their level of control can expand. Do we need Scrum Masters at higher levels? Do we need Scrum Masters? I know we're talking, we're straying into the, the um, bigger space of scaling and that sort of thing, but maybe not. Maybe we've got scrum teams that are doing completely different things, but there's still some link there. Do we need scrum masters, you know, maybe slightly further higher up the tree? Yeah. I mean, if we want collaboration to emerge, and I would argue that in some businesses we do, because that's the best way to generate value for stakeholders, shareholders and customers and employees, then if we want that, then yeah, we definitely want Scrum Masters to be present at all levels that are co contributing for that collaboration to emerge. How do we do that? How do we shift that? Yeah. So, so first, come to the Scrum Master Summit. Ask your peers, how are you doing it in your company? And, and this is a call to action for all of you to grow your network. We're not going to learn as a community if we only listen to 10 or 20 thought leaders in the world. We need to listen to each other. That's, by the way, the reason why on the podcast we interview people from all over the world every week, a new person. We've been doing this since 2015. And, you know, every year we've interviewed 50 plus Scrum Masters. Because it is really, you know, in the day to day that we learn these things. It, it's not through theory, although we do need theory. It's through action and reflection. So yes, use the theory. And we talk about books, for example, all the time and, you know, websites you can visit and people you can follow, but then do things, learn, reflect. And for that, the best way is to get together with your peers, learn what they've done, how it worked for them, share your ideas, get their feedback, right? Build that constant feedback loop of learning that you need to have in order to get better as a scrum master. So I'm a scrum master, just say I'm, I, I'm a scrum master and I completely bought in and I'm, I'm owning the collaboration base that I'm with. Now, the reason people look for the next greatest big thing is they're thinking agile coaches is they're just going to continue that, continue that um, conversation, but then they stick in the agile coach role. How do I, as a, as a collaboration master, as a collaboration um, person 
who's been doing the scrum master role and who's been owning the space and doing a really good job. How do I then look at, maybe I want to do something bigger. How, how do I push that to the next level? Like we were saying that we want scrum masters to be CEOs. So if you, that's a brilliant, how do we move them from being, and I, I'm not using the term pejoratively here, saying a lowly scrum master, because you're not, you're just such an important integral person of the team. But how do I move from being the uh, scrum master that's working with one team, maybe two teams, maybe three, to where I'm actually having impact at bigger levels and not just saying, oh, I'm scrum master now, I'm going to be an agile coach. It's I'm scrum master now, but there's something bigger for me where I can well, be useful. I mean, even CEOs have career paths. Like CEO is not the end of the line, right? So if, if we look at ourselves as, uh, you know, I want to be the best possible scrum master at the team level, that's a worthwhile role to have. If you look at yourself as, I want to be an agile coach and work with the, the whole organization. That's also a worthwhile role to have. It's just that don't forget that we need the people who work every day with the teams, whoever those teams are, could be, you know, transition teams in a transformation, could be uh, leadership teams in an organization, could be product development, HR, marketing, whatever. Like we need people who do that job. So you can become, you know, the best possible scrum master, or you can become the best possible CEO, or you can become the best possible agile coach. All or all of those are growth paths for scrum masters today. So I don't think there's one. Uh, I do think, and that's what I argue in that article. I do think that the future of the CEO role comes from today's scrum master, for the reason that CEOs will. They already have to, but they will more and more need to become collaboration specialists, especially in larger companies. I mean, what is the CEO that can know everything that is going on on a 10,000 people company? Like that idea of the mega mastermind that has the tentacles everywhere and knows everything. That's not real. It was never real. And it's even less real now. Right. We need people in that role that can create collaboration with people they've never met before just on the spot right there. And what's best than somebody who spent all their career creating collaboration? That's the Scrum Master role. And I, and I, think, it, I think it comes down to how you can help manifest that in your, in your organization. Um, I, you know, I'd hate to say the word release train engineer, <laughs> but I know, I know, oops. But like, depending on how you, like when you're, if you, if you craft the role in, in such a way, um, you can use that type of role to, you know, proliferate, pr proliferate, you can tell it's too early for me, um, it, to, to proliferate Scrum through through the organization. It's it's about how how far up the leadership ladder or the hierarchy can you can you drive Scrum? Um, and, and what kind of roles can you create and kind of have it operate in that fashion. And so there are times where we've used that release train engineer role as a way for to, to bring leadership teams together, to bring that the scrum masters together to to basically create that next level of scrum master role um, so that you can continue on. Um, I don't necessarily subscribe to the way that the scaled agile framework describes it, but you know, using that role as a way to you know, give the scrum master somewhere to go. Um, we, we use it as, I mean, in, in the organization I'm currently working on, we use the agile coach role as essentially that, that scrum master role for the, the next level up. They're really focused on the leadership. What's the leadership's backlog? What problems are they solving? Uh, as well as, you know, kind of splitting that time of working with the people down in the trenches, working day to day team, equipping them. So it's how do you proliferate the idea, the values, everything about the Scrum Master role in, in different roles in the, in the organization as you kind of scale up from the, the people in the trenches. So again, it's about kind of creating a space where that, those values, those ideas, that collaboration guru can, can thrive and expand. If, if, you know, if people start looking at that and, and, and those types of roles, 
it's still the scrum master just with a different badge it's it's about but how you pull it, how you bring those ideas up through the organization you're working with i think is the challenge yeah that's really good james um we're really coming up on time right now now vashko you've got an event coming up it's the scrum master summit how can people well a get in contact with you join the summit um find out what's happening uh, and is there anything else that you have that you want to promote while well, here? We've mentioned the podcast, which, yes, go and listen to. It's great. Um, but the summit, tell us more about that. Tell us how people can get involved um, and anything else you think is relevant. Yeah, so the Scrum Master Summit is at scrummastersummit.org. It, it is, um, you would call it a conference. So there will be talks and there will be keynotes, but it's also kind of a festival. So there will be plenty of live sessions. Uh, there's a lot of people also in Asia, which Brad, I think, will appreciate hosting live sessions during the week of the conference in May 17. So that's Monday through Friday. So May 17th to May 21st. Um, the talks and keynotes will be available for free during that week so uh, if you go and register at scrummastersummit.org you will get notified when that happens you'll get the calendar and so on uh, so all of that will be available for free during the week of the conference you will be able to purchase a vip pass which uh, will give you the content forever so it, you will keep the talks and the sessions that are recorded forever uh, but there will be also plenty of networking opportunities. I think that's one of the things that I want to focus the most with this event is in building networking opportunities to Scrum Masters to help build that clear vision for the Scrum Master role and to help build that clear identity. Because if we're not networking with people who have the same role as we do, we can't define our identity together. And that's my point. We need to define that identity as a community mm, together. That's fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Vasco. And uh, to you, our listening audience, look, if you enjoyed this episode, give us a review, rating, leave comments on iTunes, Stitcher, your podcasting platform of choice. Uh, it really helps others find us. If this is your first time tuning in, hey, why not subscribe to us? And if you want to join in the conversation and just share your thoughts, we have a Discord that um, people can definitely go to. Uh, we have the Coalition a forum site where you can come and just ask questions and get some support. And um, finally, it's listeners like you that help support us and uh, cover some of our costs and pro of hosting and production. Uh, you can see the note, show notes on how to become a patron. And until next time, this is the Agile Uprising podcast signing out.